How's your summer going? I, I've been thinking about summer and how easy it is to get distracted. And, and this week, uh, one of our, our leaders here at the church told me about his friend who, um, her husband just died. He died in his sleep, 33 years old, okay? 33 years old, they've been married over 10 years, dies in his sleep, but he died in his girlfriend's bed. He'd been having an affair for a year, unbeknownst to her. I want you to think for a moment, what in the world would go through that guy's mind as he stood before God? Can you imagine? That's when God says, it's your time. What in the world goes through your head as you stand before a holy God? I just, I, I couldn't get that picture out of my head. It's like, okay, God, you know what? Like that song we sang, you know, it's like, Lord, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. You know, I feel these temptations. I all these things I want to take from this, but I don't want to go there. God, I don't want to come to the end of my life and end up over there somewhere. That's why that song we sang, it's like, Lord, bind me. You know, grab a chain, grab a fetter and just bind me to you. Because I know myself and there's these temptations. I want to go all these places, but I don't want to end that way. I want to be with you. I want to be close to you. Look, in, in a room this size, I know there's all sorts of garbage going on in here. And I just want to say that to you as a reminder of you guys. Life is short, man. I'm saying this in love. How do you want to come before God? Know that whatever you're in the midst of doing, just picture God at that time saying, you know, you know what, it's your time now. Okay, it's, it's, it's time today while there's time, you know, get things right in your life. Man, I know there's affairs going on in this room. And I'm just going, you are, you are crazy to take a risk like that. I know there's deception in this room. I know some of your businesses are absolutely crooked. And no one else knows in this room, just God and you. I'm just guessing in, 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 a, in a group this size and, and those people that are, that are watching in the satellite room. You know what? The, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I'm just going, man, just in love, I'm going, beg God, beg the Holy Spirit, repent, turn from that, because that's not who you want to be, is it? That's not the type of life you want to live. I mean, that's why we're in this room, because we're saying we don't want to be that. God, we want to be sold out. We want to be filled with the Spirit, living for you. And I hope that's you today. And if not, I hope you prayed that prayer that we just sang, Lord, Spirit of God, you know, just, just fan into flame this passion for your name. Consume me, change me, stir it up in my heart, this passion for your name and not for all this sin. The last time I spoke, and I spoke on the Holy Spirit, and it's been so good. I've had so many positive responses about this series on the Holy Spirit. But the last time I spoke, I got a lot of confusion coming back. A lot of people were confused after my last message over one issue. When I preached on Acts 2.38, uh, where the passage says, Repent and be baptized and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've had all sorts of emails and phone calls and letters asking, Okay, well, it sounded like you were saying I have to repent and then be baptized and then receive the Holy Spirit. And then other people were asking, well, can I be a Christian without being baptized? Others were saying, can I be a Christian without repenting? Can I be a Christian without the Holy Spirit? And when does the Holy Spirit actually come in? If I just repent and do I get the Holy Spirit right then without being baptized? And all these questions came in and I, I want to answer them all with a question back at you. Why do you ask? Because they didn't ask. 
They, they asked one question. When they heard the message, when they heard the gospel message, when they heard that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that he paid the penalty for their sins, he heard that he was buried and he rose from the grave, they asked a different question. They asked, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Peter's response was, well, you need to repent, be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? They didn't ask any questions after that. What they did was they repented, got baptized, and were filled with the Holy Spirit. I know, it's a crazy response, isn't it? They just did it. But we would rather ask a bunch of questions, and we would rather philosophize and speculate and go, well, yeah, but technically, can't you really, I mean, did they really have to get baptized? I mean, I mean, and when, when did the Holy Spirit come in? Was it when they got under the water? Was that when He came in? Or when they come out? Or was he already in them, or did it take the Holy Spirit to get them to repent anyways in the first place? Or, or what if they were on their way down and they trip? You know, what, what, what about this? What about that? You guys, they just did it. I, I don't understand the questions. I don't understand where the questions are coming from. Because my seven-year-old, my seven-year-old was in service and she understood. My seven-year-old was in service that Saturday night, comes home crying and says, Dad, I want to be baptized. I want the Holy Spirit in me. I want to follow Jesus. And uh, I go, great, baby. That's great. So you know what you need to do? Come back tomorrow morning and get baptized. And so she did. And she's up here crying and, and asking Jesus, you know, asking for the Holy Spirit to come into her life to help her live the way that she went. My seven-year-old got it. She didn't come home and say, well, okay, Dad, explain this to me. <laughs> it's crazy, but she just obeyed. It was like those believers back then that didn't sit around as a bunch of theological scholars. They just heard, repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Great, let's do it. They didn't care when the Spirit came in and what second, what moment, what came first. They just did it. And what's crazy to me is that we have gotten so off track in America, and the way we talk about the Bible, that nowadays people say you can be a Christian without repenting, being baptized, or having the Holy Spirit. I mean, how many gospel presentations do you hear where people say, well, just walk down an aisle, pray a prayer, receive Jesus? Okay, where do you see that in the Bible, though? I mean, I did it. I did it as a kid because that's what I was told and I was in the system and I felt just absolutely fine with it until I started reading the scriptures. And it never sat well with me. Where does it talk about this prayer for receiving? I see repentance. I see baptism. I see the Holy Spirit. But, but what, where, where, where are we getting this? And the longer I'm a believer, the more I'm going, wait, I, am I going crazy here? Or are we missing the obvious Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was simultaneous to them. You know, when, when Paul wrote to the, to the Romans, he just says, you know, don't you understand when you were, ba when you were baptized? When, you, not if, when you were baptized? It was just an assumed thing. A Christian was baptized. See, but we've screwed everything up because we really do say, you know what? You can, uh, you can be a Christian and, well, you don't really have to get baptized. We don't talk about baptism. And that always bugged me, and, and, and that's why I thought, wait, no, in the, in the New Testament, it seemed like they believed, and then they just went and got baptized. Right then. I mean, they heard the message, cut to the heart, they repent, got baptized, were filled with the Spirit. You go to Acts chapter 8, Philip's talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, he explains everything to him, and he goes, well, shouldn't I get baptized? He goes, yeah, let's stop the chariot and go down to a body of water. You know, it's when people got the message, they just went and got baptized, and I'm like, well then we should do it that way. And that's why we got a baptismal up here. I'm going, you know what? And when someone believes, they should get baptized. When someone decides to repent, they should get baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't have a class. They, they didn't wait until they proved themselves. They just went and did it. Why don't we just do it the way they did it? Why don't we just preach it together? Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Where did this whole walking the aisle you know, thing come from? Where did this, you know, just slip up your hand and pray a prayer with me thing come from? I mean, do you see it? If you see it somewhere in Scripture, show it to me. Because I, I haven't seen it. I haven't found it yet. I'm not saying it's wrong to do those things. I'm just saying, well, let's do what the Bible obviously says to do. Let's go back to the early church. The, the church in its purest form. Christ just descended and here the church is starting and that's what they did. 
And it was just the assumed thing to do, and let's just obey. Um, but I think it's, it's nuts that um, we do so much talking and questioning and these theological debates when I'm saying, let's just apply the obvious. If you just repent, be baptized, and are filled with the Holy Spirit, what's there to fight about? If you just obey it, then we don't have to come up with all these questions. Um, <laughs> you know, it's almost like I, I just go, wait, it, shouldn't we have figured this out centuries ago? <laughs> you know, I mean, what, isn't this just simply what's in there? Um, because you guys, what's crazy? This idea of repentance, this is the scariest part to me, is that, do you understand what repent means? It means to turn. It means to do a 180. It means you're heading one direction and you do a 180 and head a different direction. That's what it means to repent. You turn. Now most of the time when someone talks about becoming a Christian, here in America anyways, when they talk about this, they don't talk about turning to follow Jesus. Most people never turn. Most churchgoers, they're heading a certain direction in life. They see Jesus. Jesus, come follow me. And they go, no, you follow me. And the church will go, that's a good idea. That's easier. Then I can keep going down this path. I can keep doing whatever I want to do. And now I've got Jesus on top of it. And he's following me around. I can use him, especially at the end when I'm about to burn in hell. He'll keep me from there. I could really use Jesus. You guys, that's not the message. We were never told to tell Jesus to follow us on our path. We're supposed to see Jesus over there and go, repent. I want to follow you now. I was heading down this direction. I was doing these things. But now I see a better way of life. I see a better way to live. I see someone I want to follow. Not lead, follow. And it's just so crazy. I mean, that's what a Christian is, is a follower of Jesus. And it is, it is sickening to me that so many people teach nowadays that you can be a follower of Jesus Christ without actually following it doesn't make sense to me, but that's what's taught, is just receive Jesus. Pray this prayer. He'll keep you from hell. You just, just do your same old thing, but now Jesus is with you in life. That is not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is Jesus saying, come, follow me. I got a better way of living, okay? You know, all that sin, you know, that's not going to bring you fulfillment. Follow me. You know what? And, and don't you want to spend eternity, eternity with me? Don't you want to be with me forever? Aren't I this amazing treasure? Don't you want me? And many of us look at him and go, yeah, I will follow you anywhere. Anywhere. See, repentance, repentance, the best illustration I could think of is, uh, I've shared this before, was 15 years ago in my life I repented. 15 years ago I was dating a girl. I was dating a girl. Life was good. And then I was in church one day and this guest soloist comes named Lisa. And so I'm, life is fine for me. I'm going down this road, got a girlfriend, everything else. And then suddenly I see this girl on stage singing. And she's singing, you know, don't you wish your girlfriend was... Um, <laughs> you guys shouldn't know that song. Okay. I don't know what she was singing, but that's what I was hearing. Okay. And, and it's this whole idea of, okay, suddenly it's like, yes, I do, okay, you know, and it was not one of those things where I just keep going down this journey in life and saying, hey, G you know, Lisa, why don't you join me and this other girl and, and all these things that I've got going on. It's a turning where I go, okay, I am going after her. I will drop everything and go after her. Now you multiply that a thousand times and that's what repentance is about. It's about you are heading one direction in life and you see someone so beautiful. Jesus Christ and his way of living and his promise of eternal life and you say, you know what? I don't care about anything. Mother, father, kids, my, my house, my job, my future, my boyfriend, girl, it doesn't matter. Man, I've got to have this Jesus. I'm going to follow after him and his, that's repentance. 
Now, have you ever repented? Have you ever seen God as a treasure that great that you you don't care about anything all of a sudden? The things of this earth grow strangely dim, right? Because you're like, wow, I could have God. I want that. That's repentance. And then he says, be baptized. Now, does baptism save you? If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll just answer it biblically, even though I just feel like, why is it even a question, you know, just do it. Then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my philosophy. Um, but let's look at it biblically. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, and uh, we'll start in uh, like verse 20-ish. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 20, I know it's the middle of a sentence, but who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Okay, so he says here, he says, now this baptism saves you. He does say that, but right after he makes that statement, he clarifies he goes, he goes, not, I'm, I don't mean that the, the literal water that removes the dirt from your flesh, you know, that physical thing that's going on. He goes, I'm not talking about that. He goes, the baptism does save you. Baptism saves you. He goes, but it's not the physical water taking the, the dirt off of your body. He says, but it's this pledge to God that you're making at that time. It's this pledge to God for a pure or clean conscience or a good conscience. Other translations say it's this appeal to God for a clean conscience. This is calling out to God. See, your baptism was supposed to be the time that you pledged yourself to Jesus Christ. And he uses the example, the illustration of Noah's Ark. He says it's just like Noah's Ark. He says, you know, when the wrath of God came, there were eight people that were saved. And they were saved by climbing into the ark. Okay? They were saved by going into the ark. See, that's a picture of baptism. A baptism is this idea of I am climbing into the ark that God has provided. And that ark is Jesus Christ. I am going inside of him. I am, you, you know, baptized into Christ, as Romans describes. We're going into Christ. We're going into his salvation, into his sacrifice, into everything he's done for us. And that's why baptism, it says that when you're, you're, you're baptized, you're, you're being buried with Christ and just like Christ rose from the grave you're rising again to a new life it's, it's you going into the ark but, but it's different it's you going into Jesus now the baptism the actual physical act of the water you know cleaning off the dirt from your skin that's not what saves you but it says what saves you is this appeal you're making at that time it's this public confession that you're making at that time that, you know what, I am buying into Jesus Christ. I am going all into him. I am climbing into him as the ark of my salvation. He goes, that's what saves you, and that's what baptism represents. And so understand that God has prescribed in Scripture a method by which we confess to him and to everyone else around us, that we are going into Jesus Christ, that we have accepted everything that's about him and we are being baptized into him. We're climbing into the ark of the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. See, God never says in there that if you want to follow me, raise your hand, walk down an aisle, pray a prayer. What he prescribed is repent. Be baptized. That's your calling out. That is your confession um, for a clear conscience. And he says, and then you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this idea of the Holy Spirit. I was thinking about this because there's not a whole lot of talk about the Holy Spirit. And I believe the reason is because there's not a lot of talk about repentance. Because I want you to think about this. If all you want to do is keep yourself from going to hell and you have no desire to really turn and follow Jesus, why do you even need the Holy Spirit? What do you need him for? So maybe you could do some tricks? Perform a couple of miracles or something? I mean, what's the use of the Holy Spirit? If all you want to do is go, man, I was going to go to hell and oh, I could pray this prayer and then I don't have to. Okay, great. Pray the prayer. You don't have to. Why do you need the Holy Spirit? Yeah, the, the Holy Spirit is only if you want to repent. See, the Holy Spirit is if you truly do want to follow Jesus and you see a way of living that you go, you know what, I want to live the way God has prescribed in this book. I agree with God. I don't just hate the penalty of sin. I hate sin itself. I don't want to be a murderer. I don't want to lie. I I would love at the end of my life if I had no greed, if I had no hatred, no bitterness, no anger, no lust, that I was just totally pure. I actually want to live this way, the way that God says and has outlined in Scripture. I actually think that would be better than being an addict or, or, or being, you know, well, whatever, stuck in my sin. I want this, and because I want this, well, you know what, guess what? I can't pull that off on my own because left to myself I'm going to wander I'm going to go mess around I'm going to do all of this stuff so I go God would you give me your spirit because I, I want to live this way and I can't do it on my own and so because I want to repent I realize I'm not going to be able to pull this off I need your Holy Spirit see why do I want the work of the Holy Spirit in my life because I want to be pure I, I actually want to be holy I'm not looking at this thing going, oh, great, I gotta, I gotta be faithful, I gotta be honest, I gotta, you know, I'm going, I want that for myself. And so God, put your spirit in me, have him just keep changing me, changing me, changing me, because that's the type of man I want to be at the end of my life. And not only that, but the Bible also explains that the reason why God gives us the Holy Spirit, he says, is for the common good. He explains that he will gift you, the Holy Spirit will distribute gifts all around this room and all of the services, all these different people. Why? He says it's for the purpose of the common good. He gives you a gift so that you can help the other people in this room become more holy, more pure, more right. You see, it's it's this idea when I, I pray to God and I go, God, I want your spirit just like moving through me this weekend. Why? So that I can be powerful? No. I want His Spirit moving through me because, believe it or not, I actually care about a lot of you in this room. A lot of you that I have relationships with. And some of you, I I don't know you, and yet I I don't mean that I don't care about you. I care, but it's, you know, especially with those that I actually know and those you have a relationship with. It's like, God, I want to be a part of helping these people in this room, your body, God. I want these people to be in love with you. Because that's, that's the greatest thing for them. And that's the greatest way for their future. Man, I want them to be consumed, just passionate. It's also, it's not just that, but it's for the sake of God. Like, my dream at the end of my life, it is not my dream or my goal at the end of my life to have thousands of people in this church that I can say to God, God, look, there's thousands of people over there and and they all kind of like you. He's not interested in that. I could have 20,000 people that, but they showed up. They go to church every once in a while. Some of them gave a whole 2%, you know, whatever. They, they you know, one of them tossed. I, I don't, I'm not interested in that. What I want, see, the end of my life is to, to have this army, you know, of people that are crazy about Jesus, where I could stand before the throne one day and go, God, look at that. I don't know, maybe 100 people. Maybe there's more. Maybe it's thousands. 
But look at those people. Man, they're crazy about you, God. They would do anything for you. You saw the way they live their lives. I I want this bride that's pure and spotless and to know that I was a part of that, that I somehow was used. And so, God, could you use me to, to lead other people to you, but truly to you, who actually repent and actually want to follow you and actually become more and more like you? And so that I can come... Because I'm, when I look at Scripture, that's what he wants. He doesn't care how huge... His bride is. He he cares about how pure it is, how devoted. He goes, man, I want a devoted, loving bride. Read the whole Old Testament. That's all he ever wanted of Israel. It wasn't about numbers. It was about who's here, who's really sold out for me. I want a faithful bride. And so I want to be used in my life before I die. I want to gather. And and that's why I love some of you that are so in love with Jesus because there's just like this kinship. There's like this, oh, okay, you get it. You get it. You get it. You're in love with Jesus. And that's why I like coming in this room. Uh, you, you know, I was telling Jim, I love worshiping with our band because I, I know them personally. You know, I know Diana, who just is crazy about Jesus. And it's just, oh, that's my sister in Christ, you know. And it's, it's just awesome. And I see it in Drew's life, you know. And, 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 and I, I love people that I know. And it's like, you know what? We are in love with Jesus. And, and I, I'd be proud to stand side by side with them before the throne of God. And because I want to do that at the end of my life, I say, okay, God, I need the Holy Spirit. I don't need the Holy Spirit to draw a crowd. Okay, I can draw a crowd by being funny, juggling, whatever. Okay, I can get a crowd here. That's not what I want. I want something beyond that. I want people whose lives are just obsessed with Jesus Christ, and I can't accomplish that by my own power. And so if that's your desire, and you go, ooh, I want to be a part of that, you know, most likely you're not going to be the one up front teaching. Um, but, you know, you go, maybe you're the ones that's behind the scenes counseling. And or maybe you're the one that's discipling and you've got a group of people in your house, a few couples together, and you're just, just teaching them the Word of God and you're living it out and explaining it to them and you're being used supernaturally somehow to help create this army, this bride, this group of friends of God that are really pursuing Him. If you want to do something supernatural like that and be a part of that type of movement, then you need the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is for those of you in this room that would say, I want to live a holy life, and I want to help others live a holy life. Well, great, then you need the Holy Spirit. But if that's not your goal in life, then why do you even need Him? If you don't want to repent, you don't really want to follow Him into serving the people of Christ. Because you know what? You can come to this church without the Holy Spirit. You can fit in perfectly without the Holy Spirit. You can sing without the Holy Spirit. When I um, I want to share something because it's, it's stuff that I'm I'm still just now really coming to grips with and figuring out. Um, let me just share my testimony and then ask you a question. Growing up, I heard things about Jesus. Probably from five years old on, I heard things about God and I believed in God. Okay. Then in junior high. My mom took me to a crusade, an evangelistic crusade at First Baptist Church in Stockton. And uh, I just remember the guy's name now. I think it was Jim Wilson was the name of the, I didn't know what the other services. He was the, the guy that was preaching, just this evangelist fired up in this three-piece suit just going after it. And I remember sitting in the back and him saying, don't you deny Jesus, you deny Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And then here, here were his exact words, if you deny him, it would be better for you to bite your tongue off and spit it out. And I thought, ooh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I remember, I remember walking up an aisle and praying with a little old lady and, and asking Jesus to come into my life because I did not want to go to hell. And then later on, Someone had told me about baptism. You know, you should get baptized. That's what you're supposed to do once you believe. And, oh, okay. I'll get baptized. And then in high school, someone explained to me what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. To, you know, that you're supposed to have this love relationship with Jesus. I'm like, really? Okay, now I get it. I'm getting more of the picture. And now I understand the cross better. Now I get it. 
Then when I was in college, I was told that I was supposed to repent. I was told that, you know what? Accepting Jesus means accepting him as your Lord. It means that you're willing to follow him. That's what the word Lord means. It means master. I'm like, really? Okay, I'll follow him. It's later on that I really understand the Holy Spirit and understand, okay, this Holy Spirit is supposed to come into me. And I know he's in my life now. Question. When did I become a Christian? When I repented, when I first believed, when I got the Holy Spirit. When did I get the Holy Spirit? When I was baptized? When was it? There's a bunch of different answers in this room, right? And, and isn't that the testimony of many of you where you're going, man, I, I, love, I wish there was like a moment where I could just nail and say, oh, it was right then. You know? You guys, here's what I'm understanding in Scripture. A believer is someone who believes, right? <laughs> believe er. Okay. A believer is someone who believes and applies the truth when he or she hears it. That's what a believer is. You hear the truth, you believe it, and you obey it. All I know is when I would hear the truth of God's word, I would obey it. And then as I learned more truth, I obeyed it. As I learned more truth, I obeyed it. I'm still learning truth. There's still thing, many things in that book I don't understand, and I'm learning, but as I learn it, I obey it. So all I know is that I'm a believer, and I'm a follower of God's truth. We can sit here and debate, well, what about this, this, this? I don't know. But my point to you this morning is this. Some of you... Maybe like me, you got like bits and pieces all the time. And some of you didn't know that you were supposed to be baptized. So were you saved back then? I'm just saying, don't even worry about that. I'm asking you, now that you hear the truth, are you going to obey it? Maybe you didn't know that you were supposed to repent. I'm saying, well, now that you know you're supposed to repent, are you going to repent? Okay. Maybe you didn't understand what the Holy Spirit was all about until these last few weeks. Now that you understand, you want the Holy Spirit? See, because a believer, a follower is one, is as he hears truth, he, he follows. And so let's, let's not spend our time trying to figure out, well, is this person, is that person? It's just, just look at your life right now, and as you're confronted with truth, do you follow it? Or do you sit there and you just want to talk? We want to talk, 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 rather than obey. Just repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then we don't have to talk so much. You guys, let me just, uh, I, I don't know, it's like so easy to me, but, but I, 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 maybe I'm being too simplistic, but, but I'm just looking at scripture and going, no, my little kid got it. Like an 80, 80 something year old man came up to last service and he got it. He goes, man, I've been going to church my whole life and it was that simple. And I just got it. How did that happen? Let me just ask you a few questions and we're done. Four questions. And I, I, I want you, I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're two years old. I don't care if you're 90. I want you to answer these questions for yourself from the depths of your heart. This is not a survey. We're talking about eternal life. So do you believe these things in your heart? I'm asking you as an individual, forget everyone else in the room, every relative you've ever had. What is in your heart? And I ask you this because all the stats, you know, especially to you who are teens or students in here, because all the stats tell you now that 80, 80% 80 of the people who grow up in church all through high school, 80% of them, by the time they're out of college, will deny their faith, will walk away from the church. And the reason is because it was never yours to begin with. You're just here for mommy and daddy. You don't even know what you believe in your own heart. And that's why I'm asking you, you as an individual, answer these questions for yourself. Number one, do you, you in your very core of your being, do you believe that God is great? I mean really great. 
How great? How great is God to you? See, because because most of us would say, yeah, God's good. Yeah, I'd like to have God. Yeah, why not? What the heck? Throw him in. I'm not talking about that. The Bible, the Bible, remember this Bible teaching church? What the Bible says, what the Bible teaches is that the person who gets it, the person who gets the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who sees this field and sees a treasure in this field that is so valuable that he walks away from the field and says, man, I will sell everything I have to get that field. I got to have it. I don't care. All my other stuff is junk. I'm consumed with this field. I will give away everything if you give me this field. God says that's the person who understands me. Is the person who who sees Jesus, who sees a relationship with God and go, man, I can have that? Forget my mom, my dad, my brothers. I don't care. I don't care about the career. I don't care about my girlfriend. I don't care how many people like me. I just got to have this God. Is he that valuable to you as an individual? Do you see God as great? Because God sees himself as great. He says it many times, I am a great God. He believes it about himself. The question is, is do you believe that he's really that great? Or are you sitting there going, well, I don't know. I I, I don't know if I want to give all that up for him just just to get God. Well, then you don't get it. Question number two. Do you believe that God's way of living is best? I mean, do you really, really, do you believe that the way that he outlines it in this book, do you agree with God that sin is a bad thing? Uh, not, the, not just the penalty of sin, not just hell. We'll all agree hell is bad, right? Amen? Bad. Okay. It's not just the penalty of sin, but do you hate sin itself? Like you really don't want to lie. You really don't want to be greedy. You really don't want to feel this hatred towards someone else. You want to live. I mean, God, Jesus has outlined this way of living. Do you really look at that and go, I want to be that person? Do you? Do you really want that? Or secretly, aren't there a bunch of things over here, a bunch of things that you want to do that you know are wrong in God's eyes and you're not sure if you're ready to give it up yet? Or are you really a person that says, no, that's better? See, because God thinks his way of living is best. Question is, do you? Thirdly, do you in your heart want to be in love? In love with God? Do you? Do you want to be in love with him? I'm not talking about intellectual belief. I'm not asking you, do you want to intellectually believe that a God exists? That's not the question in Scripture here. The question is, is do you want to love, be in love with God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do you think, I am a human being that wants to be in an intimate love relationship with my Creator? See, because that's what God wants of you. He wants a love relationship. The question is, is do you want that? Really? Really? And then finally, last question. Do you want to have power in your life? A power to actually live out this holiness and a power to actually impact other people to live out this holiness. Do you really want that? Do you really want to spend your life getting rid of sin, putting to death the deeds of the flesh and spend your life encouraging other people to do the same thing? Do you really want to do that with your life? Because God wants to. He wants to put his spirit in you. He wants to empower you. The question is, is do you want it to accomplish these purposes? So those four questions, see, once again, do you think God is great? Do you think his way of living is best? Do you want to be in a love relationship with him, in love with him? And do you want his power to change you and use you to change others and impact others and build others up. Because that's what God wants. God thinks he's great. God thinks his way of living is great. God wants to be in a love relationship with you and God wants to put his spirit in you to empower you. And if you can answer yes to all four of those questions and you agree with God, then repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
That's it. <laughs> That's the gospel. <laughs>